Hi, welcome to Ignite Your Passion with me, Bonnie Lang. Photographer David Valdez has captured so many incredible moments. His images are a part of history that will live on throughout time. David worked as the chief official White House photographer and photographer for President George H.W. Bush. If you've seen the famous photo of the Bushes on vacation sitting in bed with their grandchildren, then you've seen David's work. He talks about how photography has changed and his experiences working so closely with the president. He has had an incredible journey and continues to be a part of history in his local community. Take a listen. Also, I wanted to ask you, or in during the interview, what kind of camera you used? And I meant to ask that. So I was walking with my fiance and he said, well, those are not the questions that I would ask. I would be asking, <laughs> what kind of camera is that? And yeah, He's yeah. a photographer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, so it, it goes back to the very beginning. And um, uh, when I graduated high school, um, I got drafted and I went into the military and they said, you're going to be a photographer. And I literally turned to the guy next to me and I said, what is that? I don't even know. And um, uh, so we started on four by five speed Graflex cameras and this was all black and white in those days. And, and so it's a four by five inch negative and you would take the picture and you pull a piece of paper out and the, you'd get to the next piece of film and, and um, uh, but then quickly we evolved into two and a quarter cameras and then Nikon cameras. And, and so I started Nikons and, and um, then, you know, in my career, different places I went, they always had Nikons. And then when I got to the White House, they had Nikons, and uh, Canon at that time uh, uh, gave me some Canon cameras to use. But you know, I was working in the White House, and it was it was hard to to learn a new camera system. So I stuck with the Nikons, and then when I got out uh, and went to add up photography for the Walt Disney Company, I got down there, and Disney had a partnership with Nikon, and and the Disney photographers were using Nikon, so I stayed with Nikon. Now, in between the White House and, and, uh, and Disney, Canon uh, asked me to do an ad for them, and they gave me some of their cameras, and they said, well, let's do an ad. Well, a couple of months went by, and they, they, didn't, um, uh, they didn't do the ad, and so they said, well, you know, since we didn't do the ad, we need the cameras back. And, and literally that same day, um, Nikon called me and they said, well, we've been thinking about you and wondering if you needed uh, any cameras. And so I literally was packing up the Canons to take them to, Ni to Canon. And then I swung by the Nikon office and picked up a whole bunch of Nikons. So I used those. And then um, after Disney, uh, I was for a little short while uh, vice president of a company called uh, um, Blue Pixel Digital Experts. And we wrote the curriculum for the Nikon Digital School of Photography. So Nikon gave us one of everything they had. And, and we just had a room full of Nikon gear. I mean, binoculars and everything. And um, uh, so today I'm still a Nikon guy just because I've had that lifelong relationship. You know, a lot of, a lot of my friends uh, have switched over to Sony cameras and uh, some are with, with Canon, um, but I'm an old diehard Nikon guy. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and so, so I stick with them because, you know, the, the, it's really not about the camera as much as as what's in your heart and what you what you see and and the camera is really just a tool i i have used my iphone many 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 times professionally on professional jobs and i've had stuff published and and prior to the pandemic i was doing uh, social media photos photos for amtrak and i was riding the amtrak trains and and uh 
um, probably 50% of the photos I took on on the Amtrak trains were with my iPhone. So so the, to me, the camera is just is just a tool. And and uh, uh, you know, I know how to work the tool, and I don't have to think about the tool. Uh, so I can just think about seeing and and uh, and and just capture what I need to capture. So so but yeah, it's been an icon. So tell us where so where are you currently living? I live in Georgetown, Texas and <laughs> and, and and just north of Austin and and I um, I was born in Alice, Texas and um, I've actually been invited to speak down in Alice, Texas. There, there. Uh, uh, Alice is is uh, close to Corpus Christi in Kingsville, Texas, right, right, butting up against the King Ranch, and and uh, um, uh, they're trying to revitalize uh, uh, downtown Alice, Texas, and. Somebody said, "Well, David Valdez was born here, and he wound up working at the White House, and so we should invite him down. So I'm going to do that sometime this summer, and it'll be a lot of fun. And I've been in touch with some people, and they've bought some of my books, and and they're going to have me sign some. And and uh, uh, I have a bunch of um, framed White House photos that I'll probably take down there and." give to the city or, or whatever they want to do. And uh, so that, that's kind of fun. But I, I do a lot of public speaking around the country. And um, um, I, I go, I, I'm just out and about in the world and, and just random people come up. And I, I was out at a, a veterans thing just not too long ago. And, and this guy in a, in a Union Jack uniform, so he was one of those uh, collar guard guys, you know, the, the pointy hats and, yeah. and the red jackets. And, and he came up and, and said, oh, I'd love to have you come speak to my group. And he's like in the Daughters of the American Revolution. And so I'm going to go speak to them. And so I got on their email chain and, well, they're going to have the collar guard come out and, and do all of this stuff. And, and it's like, well, you know, it's just David Valdez here telling some stories, but they're all excited. So so it'll be fun. Uh, I'm, I'm ecstatic just to have you here today with everything you've done in your career and what you're continuing to do. Did you like, so when you were younger, before you joined the Air Force, did you have any experience with photography? Yeah, so see this camera right here? That's, that's my original Roy Rogers camera. And uh, 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 I used to go around as a little kid and take photos, and I actually did a photo album, and this is uh, uh, my original photo album that I did with Little Ribbon. And and when I was the president's photographer, um, when I was the president's photographer, uh, we did an event down in San Antonio where my parents were living, and they invited my the White House staff over at their house for a barbecue. And this photo album that I did, my mom stops everybody and says, hey, I have to show you something David did as a little boy. And she pulls this up. It's like I was horrified. And uh, so as a little boy, I was out with, with that little camera right there taking pictures. And, and you know, like uh, it didn't click. It, you know, I, I was just doing it because I had the camera and, and, and I could, I could, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not good at math or, you know, those kind of things, but I have an eye and, and I see things differently than other people. And, and, uh, and so I, I guess I was expressing that as a little kid. And, and when I went into the military, it wasn't Oh, this guy has been taking pictures. We'll make him a, be a photographer. They made me a photographer because the military did the aerial photo reconnaissance over North Vietnam, and they were all getting killed, and they needed photo people. and And there was um, uh, 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 aerial photography and motion picture photography, and photo lab work, and still photography. Well, I got still photography. 
and I was assigned to a, a, the 836 Combat Support Unit based in Tampa, Florida. And um, there I was photographing at 18 years old, uh, the generals that were running the Vietnam War. It was, a, it was kind of the last step off before people went to Vietnam. And, and so I was exposed to a lot of classified material. And, and a lot of photographers, when they get started, they're taking pictures of babies or pets. And when I started, I was taking pictures of generals. And, and, and so, it, you, you know, it, it grew me up really fast because uh, it was also a, a training place and people were uh, get killed in the training. And I would have to go out with the medical team and photograph uh, uh, you know, bodies and autopsies and that kind of stuff also. And, um, uh, but that training gave me the discipline and, and, and taught me the, the, the technical side of photography. So I, I, you know, learned how to do the, you know, the technical aspect of the photography and, and also, you know, kind of learned, uh, uh, the d discipline of working with high level people. And I think that helped me in my career, um, you know, because in the history of the United States, only 12 people have been the president's photographer. And of the 12, I'm number five. So, so you know, it's a small group of people. So not everybody gets to be the president's photographer. And, and I was thinking about this the other day, uh, uh, in, at, at Disney, uh, there, there's only been, besides myself, three other people that have been in charge of photography for Disney. So, so it's kind of a unique group that I've been involved with in my career. Back to when you were doing photography in the military, and thank you so much for your service. How did you handle dealing with I mean, taking photos of deceased people. I mean, how did that, did that affect you emotionally? Well, you, you know, you know, uh, it, it's kind of funny. You know, I, I've talked to uh, uh, photojournalists that cover war and, and, you know, when you put the camera up to your face, it's almost like it, it's a, a barrier between you and what's out there. And, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I don't really talk about it a lot, but, but and, and, you know, most people that experience things like that really don't, um, but, but uh, it um, uh, kind of one of the things that always is like in the back of your mind is why them and why not me, you know, what happened that they got killed and I didn't. And, and every once in a while, I mean, decades later, uh, sometimes something will, will strike me and, and hey, you know, you're, maybe you're watching a movie or somebody's having a conversation about something and it's like it really like hits deep in your heart and soul that, um, you know, you kind of had that experience, but, you know, while you're living it, um, you know, the, the camera is kind of that wall between you and that reality. And, and uh, I, I've heard photojournalists say that, and, and, you know, it's not one of those things that you really like to think about, but I, I think yeah. it is true. Uh, you know, it's like when you're up on stage and you're, and you're playing and, and you, and you know you you get you get into the music and you kind of forget about the audience yeah. uh, because you're so into the music and and that's kind of the same thing uh, it, you know it, it's it's like in the oval yeah. office when you go into the oval office and it's you and the president and maybe one other person and people say oh well you know you must have heard all, all this stuff and it's like well yeah but but what's going through your head is Oh, uh, look at the light coming through the window behind the, the desk in the Oval Office. Maybe I can play with that and I'll, I'll move over here and, and oh, I, I see this person, this guest is, is animated and, and, and um, uh, they're having some fun or they're, they're sad 
and I can capture that moment and I'm in, in your head, you're saying, well, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, boom. And, and so you're not thinking about, oh, we're getting ready to go uh, uh, attack Iraq and, and uh, remove Iraq from Kuwait or something like that, or, or the Berlin Wall just came down or, or something, you, you know, in, in your head, you're, you're like, you're thinking how to get the best photo of the moment with conditions that you're faced with. Yeah. Well, how did that transition happen that you started working as the chief photographer for the White House for George H.W. Bush? Well, so so I was in the military four years. And um, when I got out, I moved up to uh, Washington, D.C. And, and got a job as a photographer uh, with the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. And it's like, well, what is that? Well, if you look in history uh, and, and the photos of the depression, um, uh, those photos were taken by photographers from uh, um, uh, the Department of Agriculture and, and they were sent around the country. Uh, it was called, I think, the Farm Security Administration. And, um, uh, and I was working in that office and, and got to see those photos and saw the history and what they had documented. And then they're all famous photos. You, you know, the, 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 the mother with her two babies sitting out in front of the, uh, you know, desert shack and in, in right here in the United States and, and uh, you know, just countless others. And, um, uh, and that was kind of that first realization that, well, the, you know, what I'm doing, the photography because um, as I was growing up, I, I never really thought about being a photographer. And, uh, you know, you watch uh, 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 the TV shows, Leave it to Be Their Father Knows Best, and, 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 and you see the, the husband in the, in the TV show putting on a suit and having a briefcase and going off to work. And you never know what they're doing, but they're doing something. And, and I always thought, that, you know, I would be a guy putting on a suit with a briefcase going off to do some office job and and uh, uh, but then um, so I was I was at, I was at um, agriculture for a year and then um, uh, the personnel persons told me that there was a job opening at HUD and I said what's HUD and they said well it's the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and and you know it's, it's career uh, uh, federal civil service grades, and it was a grade promotion. So I said, sure, I'll do that. And I, I go over there, and it's and it's like, so this is the early '70s, and 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 it was a two-man photo operation, and and we covered the the, the secretary, the uh, cabinet member uh, for the president, and went to hearings up on Capitol Hill, and and you see news stories, and you see those guys at, at press hearings and Senate hearings, and they're down on the floor. I was one of those guys. And, and um, um, but then I was also traveling around the country because it was the early 70s and, and HUD was involved with rebuilding a lot of inner cities after the race rides in the 60s. And, and so I was going to Watts and Harlem and places like that, uh, 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 taking photos of the kind of the rebuilding of the inner cities and, and um, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration was a part of HUD at the time. And so I also spent a lot of time going to uh, uh, disasters. And, and a lot of times I was sometimes the first federal government employee out there. And my photos would go back to the White House and the president would declare uh, a federal uh, emergency. And um, um, uh, but I always wanted to go to college and, and you know, because I went right into the military right after high school. While I was in, I, I started uh, kind of ticking away at, at, at taking college classes, starting at the University of Tampa and um, uh, where I was living at the time in, in Tampa, Florida. And when I got up to DC, I went to the University of Maryland. And so I'm working at agriculture and at HUD and taking uh, one class at a time. Uh, uh, studying uh, uh, 
journalism and radio and television production. And, and uh, after I got my degree in journalism, I thought, well, I'm going to go work for the Washington Post or Time Magazine, but I, I didn't really have journalism experience. <laughs> Um, uh, but um, I wound up getting hired to be the chief photographer uh, for the United States Chamber of Commerce. Now there, I was the chief photographer for Nations Business Magazine, which at the time was the largest selling business magazine in the country. And uh, then I was on assignments uh, around the nation photographing President of General Motors or, or Coca-Cola or maybe the small businessman down in, in Fresno, California and, and going to uh, uh, events related to the US Chamber of Commerce at the White House. And uh, one day, December 1983, I was on an assignment to photograph Barbara Bush, who at the time was the wife of the Vice President of the United States. And, and we were waiting for Barbara Bush to show up and, and uh, Scott Applewhite, an associated press photographer, um, uh, told me that that Vice President Bush's photographer was leaving. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. I think I'll apply for that. And I did a little research and found out that the Vice President's photographer reported to the Vice President's press secretary. So I wrote her a letter, you know, this is pre-email. I wrote her a letter and, and introduced myself and, and uh, uh, I'm a Texan. She was from Texas, and a lot of the Bush staff were from Texas. And and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where I was working at the time, was literally across the street from the White House. And uh, uh, so I walked through Lafayette Park and in, into the White House and did an interview with her. Then I interviewed um, uh, with the uh, Chief of Staff, uh, retired Navy Admiral Dan Murphy. And um, he beat me up in the interview. He was pushing my buttons and, and, and I thought, wow, this guy hates me. And, but you know, having been in the military and knowing that this guy's a retired Navy Admiral, uh, you know, I was yes, sir, no, sir, I understand. And, and uh, uh, you know, kept, kept my cool. I didn't, didn't yeah. like react to his, his pushing my buttons. But when, I, when I left, I thought, oh, there is no way they're going to hire me. <laughs> and, but then I got called back to interview with the vice president of the United States. And, and uh, so I go in and, and I'm meeting with George Herbert Walker Bush uh, for the first time. And he's walking around his office. And he's telling me, well, you know, you're going to be with me in public and in private. And, and, and we have to have this relationship. And, and um, um, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, well, he thinks I have the job, but nobody's actually offered me a job. We've never, we've never talked about salary. So, so, I, so I said, so, so do you know what the salary is? And he says, you know, I have no idea. Why don't we call Admiral Murphy and ask him? So he picks up the phone and he says, hey, hey Dan, uh, I'm in here with Dave Valdez. And he's asking me what the salary is. But through the walls, I could hear him screaming, saying, what? He's talking to you about salary. And, and well, they hired me anyway. So, that, so then my, you know, I had to get a Secret Service clearance and I had to go, you know, uh, uh, give my two weeks notice to the nation's business. And, 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 and uh, the, it was right in, in, it was December and the Bushes went down to South Florida uh, right after Christmas and, and, uh, um, I had to fly down commercially and, and uh, um, uh, I, I get down there and a White House advance person uh, greets me at the airport and, and takes me to a hotel and says, well, look, I'll take you uh, to where the vice president is in the morning. You need to be out here like at six o'clock in the morning and we're going to put you on a helicopter and fly you out to this island in, in South Florida, just south of Miami. So I do that and I get on the helicopter and I fly out there and, and uh, the next morning and, and, and the vice president greets me and he says, well, come on in, I want you to meet uh, uh, Barbara Bush. And, and we sat down and had breakfast. So my first day on the job, the first thing I'm doing is having breakfast with the vice president and his wife. 
and uh, they they were getting ready to go up to Miami, and the vice president loves the uh, cigarette race boats, and 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 the guy he was staying with manufactured those boats, and so they had several of them there, and so they decided they would take the boats and, and drive them up to Miami to go to the meeting. And uh, they asked me, he asked me if I would get back in the helicopter and take pictures of them. And so, so I did that, you know, cause I had done that in the military and, you know, so hanging out the, you know, open door of a helicopter was <laughs> not a big deal for me. And, and so we get up to Miami and, and we go into the hotel suite and, and um, his son, Jeb Bush was there and, and Jeb and his wife Columba, they had just had a baby, uh, Jeb Jr. and and uh, and and Jeb was bringing little Jebby by um, uh, to meet his grandfather for the first time. And um, um, I noticed, I, I noticed that when he came in, he 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 was telling his dad that uh, the vice president that that uh, he had to go meet with some guys and 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 would he babysit. The new baby, and and of course the vice president said sure, and and uh, and when when that happened, I noticed a lot of the staff were leaving the room, and the hotel suite, secret service left, and and no one was saying anything to me like, well, you know, you need to leave too, or, and and nobody said anything. But but when I when I was thinking back on on the history of presidential photographers and and. Yoshi Okamoto was the first with President Johnson, and and you know, I was number five of the group of twelve that have done it, and and thought of the access that Yoshi Okamoto had with with LBJ, and you can think of all the famous pictures of LBJ, you know, holding up his shirt to show his scar that he had an operation, and picking up his beagle with the, on the two ears, and 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 you know a lot, a lot of really neat photos and pictures of uh, little John Kennedy in front of the President Kennedy's desk and, and um, uh, you know, just kind of on and on. So I thought, well, those guys can do that. I'll just stay and I'll go in the bedroom with, with the vice president and his and new grandbaby and take some pictures. And then, so I did that. And at the time I was shooting film and the White House Communications Agency would process the film. So it'd be a couple of days before I got some prints and I delivered the photos to uh, the vice president. And, and then a day or so later, I got a note from Barbara Bush and she said, well, I, I love the pictures you took of Gampy. That's what they call the vice president, uh, Gampy and, and Jebby. And she said, as long as you take pictures of my grandchildren, you can go anywhere and do whatever you want to do. So that was my ticket. And, and I, I spent, you know, the next 10 years traveling around the world, we went to 75 countries in all 50 states. And, oh my gosh. Uh, you know, and it, and it was a great ride. What, how incredible is that? So did you, in a way, did you live with them or how did that work? Well, no, I, I didn't. Uh, uh, during the vice presidency, I lived in Washington, D.C. And um, uh, uh, across the street from the White House is the new executive office building. It's actually kind of caddy corner from the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, there was a parking lot in there. And so I, I would drive to work and park in there and then just walk across the street. And, and the vice president has three offices, one in the old executive office building. Um, uh, they call it the Eisenhower Executive Office Building and one in the White House. And the vice president is president of the United States Senate. And so in the US Capitol building, there is a, the vice president has an office there also. And, um, and when actually when I worked for the vice president, uh, I was an employee of the US Senate and I had to actually go up to the Capitol building and be sworn in um, uh, as an employee. And so I had two employee IDs, one from the US Senate and my White House badge. Um, um, but I lived in Southwest Washington, D.C., but then when he became president, um, uh, we moved out to Fairfax, Virginia, and, and uh, you know, my wife really liked that. It, for me, it was hard because uh, kind of a normal day would be 12 hours, 
and um, but you know it was only seven days a week uh, but moving out to Fairfax Virginia it was an hour and a half drive out there and and so you know you get off at nine or ten o'clock at night you get home at midnight and then you have to be back in the office at six o'clock in the morning um, uh, you know you know it was tough and then when he would go to Camp David uh, it, it was actually physically easier for me because I could go to Camp David and they had cabins there and, and the traveling staff and it would usually just be the press secretary and the military aide, a doctor and um, uh, you know maybe some friends and, and photographer and and so I had my own cabin there and so Camp David was nice because it was the you were right there, um, yeah. and then um, uh, you know Monday, uh, you know maybe Sunday night we'd we'd fly back on Marine One, and and go back uh, uh, to the White House. But you could, uh, when he was president, uh, uh, you could work all week Monday through Friday and Friday night, go out to Andrews Air Force Base, get on Air Force One, fly overnight to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, meet with King Fahd, get back on the plane, fly back home, and Monday morning, go to work. You know, and you're walking around and people saying, oh, what'd you do for the weekend? <laughs> I went to Saudi Arabia and Air Force One. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and you, you know, so, so I mean, it, it was it was a pretty good, pretty good run. Uh, I'll never forget, what, you know, when <clears throat> when we lost the re-election, and um, you know, I had to like, when well, now what am I going to do? And uh, I wrote a cold letter to the president of marketing at Walt Disney and introduced myself. And the guy said, "Well, you know, uh, we don't have a job for you, but we're a creative company. We can create a position for you." And and so they did that. And uh, uh, but I had to go interview with with them. And it was the first time in years that I'd flown commercially, and I didn't know what to do. And you know, who are all these strange people? And I mean, I have to carry my own bag. And, you know, where's my, my towel? Uh, you know, it's outrageous. <laughs> So. Oh, I love it. And so I did notice that you took over 65,000 rolls of film right. during the George Bush presidency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, my, myself and my team, Susan Biddle and Carol Powers, uh, were, were uh, you know, it, uh, an integral part of my team. And so we all uh, uh, contributed to that 65,000 rolls. But yeah. And they're all they're all at the uh, George Bush Presidential Library on the campus at Texas A&M University in in uh, College Station, Texas. And and uh, uh, when you walk up to the George Bush Presidential Library, I always joke and say if you squint and kind of tilt your head, it actually says David Valdez Photo Gallery. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So, and also you've actually photog photographed three generations, generations of the Bushes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, with, with, um, uh, with Vice President Bush, you know, it was, it was great fun working with the Vice President because it was a smaller staff. But, you know, and, and back in those days, you know, George W. Um, was living out in Midland, Texas, and, and you know, he was just a guy out there and, and, you know, working in the oil business and, and uh, um, but then, you know, when he became president, um, uh, the day before uh, he was elected president, uh, George W. Bush, uh, we were in Florida together and, and he was campaigning down there and, <clears throat> and I was still working for the, uh, the Walt Disney Company at the time. And uh, he and I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation and, and said, well, you know, you know, tomorrow's the election and, and when you get elected, you know, I'd like to come back and be your photographer. And, and, uh, and he says, well, I got to get elected first. Well, 
uh, Al Gore did not concede. And so everybody went back to Texas and I stayed in Florida and, and uh, uh, Eric Draper, who was uh, uh, an associated press photographer covering the George W. Bush campaign uh, at the Christmas party in Texas, uh, went up and asked him if he could uh, be his photographer and he kind of spontaneously said yes. And they hired Eric and um, uh, I got a letter from Karen Hughes um, uh, explaining that, uh, you know, well, uh, the Bush family loves me, but, uh, you know, we're, we've kind of decided to go this other way. So, and, and, but I wound up becoming um, um, a political appointee back at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And, uh, and, and it was kind of fun because I'd still go to the White House and cover events and, and George W. would be there and, and uh, you know, he'd, he'd be standing up the podium and he'd look at me and give me a little wink or, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and it was kind of fun. And then when I moved back to Texas, um, Jeb's son, George P. Bush, uh, uh, ran for Texas Land Commissioner. And, and uh, I worked on his campaign uh, as a volunteer photographer and, and it, was, it was great fun, but I, I, I would be with George P and, and I'd be taking photos of him and I, I would like have deja vu and it was like, man, I took that exact same photo of his grandfather 30 years ago. And, and, uh, and so, so it was pretty neat to, to be a part of that and, 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 and see that uh you know multi-generational thing and and you know some people I, I actually just saw on fox news I, I guess fox news has a uh, a streaming channel and and they're they were talking about uh, 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 uh political dynasty families and you know they listed the kennedys and the roosevelts and 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 the bushes and and uh, you know having been around them i, I know that they never perceived themselves as a dynasty. Um, uh, you know, they were more of a family. And, and um, uh, you know, with George P, he ran for attorney general, I guess he just lost that election bid. And so it'll be interesting to see what he does with his career. Um, um, but, uh, I think this is the first time in in a long, 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 long time that a Bush has not been in in a political office. Um, uh, Pierce Bush, uh, who's um, uh, the grandson of George Herbert Walker Bush and the son of uh, uh, Neil Bush, lives in Houston. He ran for Congress a year, two, three years ago. Um, and, and lost his bid for the congressional seat, which was actually held by his grandfather decades earlier. Well, question for you, because I do notice that you photographed one of the most uh, famous photographs of President Bush and his family, and it was actually placed on the cover of Life magazine. So how is that in capturing that moment for you? Yeah, well, well, so um, uh, uh, it, it was um, the summer before he was going to run for president, and uh, he was up in Kennebunkport, Maine, and um, um, a Life magazine wanted to send a photographer up to photograph the Bush family, and and uh, and he said, "No, I'm on vacation. I'm resting. I don't want." some photographer around and Bobby Baker Burroughs, who was the photo editor of Life magazine at the time, she's uh, since passed away, but, but um, uh, she, she was uh, determined to get some photos. And, and so uh, we went back and forth and, and she agreed to let me take some photos. And, and um, um, so I talked to Barb, Bush about it, and I, and I said, "Well, you know, Life Magazine, they, they want to do this thing," and and um, and Barbara Bush said, "Well, you ought to come over tomorrow morning and and just see what happens." And and um, she said, "Get there about six o'clock in the morning." 
So six o'clock in the morning, get over and, and walk up to the this side door and go in. And their bedroom was right there on the, on the left. And, and um, there was George and Barbara Bush in bed. And, and so I just sat on the end of the bed and, and said good morning and, and you know told them what we were going to do. And, and uh, then the grandchildren started coming in and Barbara and Jenna, uh, George W's daughters came in and, and uh, um, you know, jumped on the bed and they're in between them and, and, and Pierce is there and, and little Jeb Jr. and, and uh, Margaret Bush, a, a daughter-in-law. And so I took a couple of photos and, and we sent those to Life Magazine and, and, uh, and Bobby Baker Burroughs loved it and, and wasn't on the cover. She, she ran a uh, double truck, two full pages in Life Magazine. And then it ran on um, uh, in the best of life and classic moments of life and the best of life for the past 75 years and hung in New York City in the Time Life Building for probably 20 years. And um, um, uh, people know me for that photo and people, just kind of random people I'll, I'll meet and get to talking about, you know, like this conversation. And and, uh, and maybe they don't realize that I was the one that took the photo. And, you know, I'll bring it up and say, oh, we know that photo. I, you know, we remember that from, uh, you know, being in Life Magazine. And and uh, so so it's, it's kind of neat to have a, a photo like that. I, I was with uh, Eddie Adams one time um, who won the Pulitzer Prize for a photo he took in Vietnam of a general getting shot in the head and and and, and Carl Midens and Joe Rosenthal, uh, you know, they took the photo of the raising of the Iwo Jima flag and 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 MacArthur walking on the beach in the Philippines and and their their iconic photos in American history. And we were at Eddie's house, and 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 we were all talking about, you know, between us there were a couple hundred years of photography experience, and all of us were known for one photograph, and, and you know that one photograph that we took, and and it, it was kind of funny, and and Nick Hutt, uh, is another one of those in that group that that, um, you know, he photographed the the photo in Vietnam on the napalm girl, the little girl running down the street having been uh, hit with napalm and 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 they've become lifelong friends uh, uh, and you know he's recognized all over the world uh, as the guy who took that photo and, and so you know it's a small you know photographers and you you work a lifetime and 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 you know maybe you get one photo and, and that was my really one photo. I mean, this one back here of him, uh, a lot of people recognize that one. That's actually on the cover of my, my book. Um, that's available on Amazon. Oh, yes. <laughs> Tell me about your book. Yes. Yeah, well, <laughs> so, so uh, when I was working at the White House and we were shooting film, you know, we would make eight by 10 prints. So every once in a while, you know, something would like strike me and I'd like take an extra print and just throw it in a box. And just kind of kept an extra print. And, and um, you know, years later, like I guess the book was published in 97 um, by Texas A&M University Press. And, and uh, um, uh, I was going to write a book about my experiences but I, I, I was seeing history um, uh, kind of recording uh, George Herbert Walker Bush and, and, and you know, he, he, he lived through a lot of stuff and said a lot of things, but, but, but um, uh, when, you, when you go to Washington, D.C. and you go to the Lincoln Memorial and you go to the Jefferson Memorial, you see a visual, you see the statue of Lincoln and you see the statue of Jefferson and then up on the walls with big giant, you know, engravings are, are famous things that they've said. And, and with George Herbert Walker Bush, the one thing that's always attributed to him, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan's kind of famous line is Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Or, you know, Bill Clinton, I did not have sex with that 
young woman. <laughs> uh, you, you know, there, there are some things that presidents say that become iconic. And George Herbert Walker Bush, in his uh, uh, convention speech, said, Read my lips, no new taxes. And that line kind of stuck with him uh, because a few years after that, he actually raised taxes and, and, and everybody was all upset about that. And, and, and uh, so I, I thought, well, with the book, you know, I'm, I'm going to go and let's see if you can see him, but back up in here somewhere on the bookshelf way up above. Up yeah. Those books right there. Those are, are called the, they're the presidential papers and uh, the uh, government printing office publishes these hard copy books of everything that the president says in public, every utterance. And, um, and they also include photos. So my books, my photos are in those books also. Um, but um, um, so my idea for the book was, well, I'm just gonna show photos of him and quotes and things that he has said so that I can get quotes singled out and published. So, so that was what I did rather than saying, well, David Valdez did this, did that, and blah, blah, blah. And he, you know, and it's like, well, who really cares? And, and um, um, so, you know, when I do public speaking, I tell my story, but but uh, uh, it, you know, it's it's never really about me. It's about you know the history and and you know what I was privileged to experience and and uh, you know to work with a great guy like George Herbert Walker Bush and and uh, um, so so you know the book when it came out uh, at the opening of the Bush Presidential Library, uh, I was the first person inside. And I was sitting at a little table and I was autographing books for all the guests that came in. And, and that was a lot of fun. And, and uh, um, <laughs> all these years later, um, um, my uh, birth hometown of Alice, Texas, uh, they're inviting me down there and I'm gonna take some books down there. I guess they bought some, we'll do some book signings. And, 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 and so it's kind of fun to have that. Um, um, there was a guy uh, that was starting to write a, um, uh, a biography of me. Um, COVID hit, and you know things drifted away, and, and I don't know if we'll ever like get back to it. But um, uh, definitely, it, it, you really should. You should even look into just finding someone that will write a book because it's incredible. You're just, you know. You've done, you did this for 10 years. And so I can only imagine the stories. This is so incredible. <laughs> and we're capturing this in, you know, in an hour. But I mean, the stories that you're telling are incredible. And you know what? Can you tell me the name of the book again? I'm sorry. I... Yeah, it, it's George Herbert Walker Bush, A Photographic Profile. And, and, um, um, yeah, you, you know, it, it's kind of fun to have uh, uh, the, the um, uh, you know, it, it's unique that uh, what I was, you know, kind of honored to have the, the, the privilege to, to get to do the work. Um, uh, and, you know, it's a small group of people that have done it in their lifetime. And, uh, uh, you know, I'll always be a part of history and, and um, my, the photos are uh, the 65,000 rolls of film are archived forever and ever by the US archives at the Bush Presidential Library as the other photographers have their photos uh, archived at the other presidential libraries. But beyond that, um, uh, I got involved five or six years ago with the Briscoe Center for American History, at the University of Texas. and. And Dr. Don Carlton, the executive director, uh, realized uh, that that news photos become history. So he started reaching out to news photographers and uh, a bunch of uh, photographers. I don't know, there's 20 or 30 people now that have done this. 
myself included, that have donated their life's work to the Briscoe Center. So I have photos there from uh, the time I was in the military and Disney photos and uh, you know Amtrak stuff and White House photos and car stuff and you know it's just kind of fun to have an archive so that you know when I pass uh, you know my work lives on yeah. um, at, you know at, at, at the U.S. archives at the Bush Presidential Library and at the Briscoe Center and actually today you know everybody always says well what are you doing today and today, I, I live in, in Georgetown, Texas, which is in Williamson County. And next year is the 175th anniversary. And so I'm traveling around the county, documenting the county and showing what it looks like today. And I'm working with the Williamson Museum. I, I was just voted on as a board member of the Williamson Museum. And, um, and that's in Georgetown, Texas. and, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm documenting Williamson County and, and, you know, it's like, what does the county look like today? And, and there are old photos of Williamson County uh, from the 1920s. Well, now we're in the 2020s. And so we're a hundred years down the road. So let's just document what's going on today. You know, and it's like gas prices and COVID signs and, yeah. and you know, road construction and all the housing construction and, you know, everything, you know, there's so much going on in, in, in Central Texas. And, uh, you know, so I'm documenting our little slice of it. And that stuff will be housed at the Williamson Museum and go on display uh, uh, next year in 2023 in the Williamson Museum, but then travel around the county to schools and public libraries. So so, you know, that's kind of a fun little project that I'm, I'm working on uh, right now. And, and, but it all goes back to documenting and recording history. And, uh, you know, that's what I've done, yeah. uh, you know, in my career. And, and, and uh, so, so it's, it's kind of a fun thing to be doing and working on. Do you have any regrets in your career? I mean, it sounds like you had an incredible career <laughs> and you still you know, are just enjoying what you're doing. Yeah, yeah you know, no, you know, I, I, I mean, um, I, I should have been an investment banker, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but, but I, I, I do well now. And, and, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I think financially, I'm a lot better off than a lot of photographers, you know, at, my age, um, uh, so you know, I don't really have any regret, regrets. Uh, um, I wish when I was working at the White House that digital photography had been invented, because that would have been a whole lot better and easier. Um, it, you know, when you're shooting film and, and you go into the Kremlin or the Vatican or someplace for the first time, and you have seconds to capture history and 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 you have to look and well, what's the light like and where you know it's like a billion technical photography things uh, when you're shooting film that kind of go through your head and you've got seconds uh, to capture it you know with digital you know you just like blast away or use your iPhone or something you know and 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 you and you'll get a good image so so uh, you know. The, the yeah it would have been it would have been nice to have had uh, digital uh, photography in those days uh, you know I'll never forget uh, Kodak uh, invented digital photography and and they they um, invited me up to Rochester New York to introduce me to that while I was still working at the White House and and. It kind of in my head, I was thinking, well, you know, that that's really interesting technology. And I think that's something that when we get reelected, you know, I'll apply. And, um, but we lost the reelection. So I get down to Disney and they were shooting film and the primary function of the uh, photo office was advertising photography. And, and there, you know, we had to create images of things that maybe didn't exist yet because the marketing people needed an image and a brochure a year out so people would book a vacation. And, and so we would we would 
have to photograph pieces of things on film and 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 because we weren't in the digital world we we had to use a contractor and we'd send the the film off and get it scanned and get things put together for us and and you know everybody would have their opinion about stuff and it had to go back and you'd wind up spending you know twenty thirty thousand dollars on scanning and then Photoshop came out and 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 it was like wow you know we, we you know maybe we could use that and and uh, um, it, it was kind of hard to convince kind of the upper management I I was in marketing and then in marketing I was in advertising and then in advertising I was in the creative group and we literally created the ads and and so uh, I I needed a, a, a an Apple computer and. And um, so we, we got a hand-me-down and, and we started playing with it. And, and then Disney partnered with, with Pixar and, and Pixar came out with Toy Story. And um, uh, so you can see Woody right there peeking oh, around. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, uh, and actually there's my Disney ID badges and all that. Um, um, and with Toy Story, uh, the, um, if you if you look at the scenery in the background, you know the the houses look real, the cars is look cars look real, and it was like, well, oh, gee, we could take that technology and apply it to advertising. Maybe we make the Disney Cruise Line, or maybe we make Boardwalk Resort, or maybe we make a uh, rock and roller coaster ride at at, at the MGM studios. And, and um, uh, so my first digital image project was the Boardwalk Resort. And and I went to my boss and I said, I, I think I can do that digitally. And, and, and he said, well, give me an image or give me your job. So there was like no pressure. <laughs> but, but once we did it, um, then, then it was like, if you can think of it, we can create it, and and one of the there was a ride that came out at, at the studios called uh, Rock and Roller Coaster, and it was it was sponsored by the rock band Aerosmith, and and the theme of the ride was you you went through the queue line, and you would see Aerosmith getting ready to go to a a, a concert that they were going to perform, and and they would say, well, come on, let's go and join us, and then you. The doors would open and you'd get in the roller coaster uh, cars and and then uh, the cars were uh, made to look like uh, limousines and and uh, um, so you get in and you go on the ride. Well, the, an icon in the front of the building was this three-story tall guitar. So 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 we took the um, a, a, an image of the guitar. And, and the neck of the guitar became the, the track where the, the roller coaster ride went on. And, and uh, that was the, the iconic image of that ride. And, and it was just one of those things where, it, you know, you, you start with, you know, the physical structure, we photographed it, to put it on its side and then animated it uh, with, with the car ride on, and it, it was pretty wild. Uh, but you know, then, then if you could think of it, we could create it, and 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 that was so dramatically different than at the White House, where it was like you just documented what was in front of you. Uh, I'll, I'll never, I'll never forget the very, very first thing I did at Disney was this uh, annual Teachers Award ceremony, and it was. A, black tie event and Disney music and all this. So it was really a, a hoity-toity thing. And, and uh, at the end of the evening, people would walk into this other room and there's Mickey Mouse in a tuxedo and they would get their photo with Mickey Mouse. So they'd walk into the room and they'd say, oh, Mickey Mouse, I get my photo with Mickey Mouse. And like a few months earlier, people were walking into the room and saying, oh, the president of the United States, I get my photo with the president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like uh, both are really cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, humbling experience, but but uh, you know, being with the president, um, uh, we were out on a golf course one day, and and uh, 
uh, up in Kenny Bunkport and the military aide walked up and said, uh, Mr. President, the Soviet Union's collapsed. You know, we all kind of looked at each other and it's like, wow. And um, uh, then we finished playing the round of golf. But uh, after that, and, and the Berlin was, wall was coming down, uh, the political people were saying to the president, well, you need to go to Berlin and stand on the wall and wave the flag and say, well, look at, look at us, the United States, we won the Cold War. And he said, no, it's, it's not our victory, it's their victory, um, uh, and let them celebrate. And, and then he said, if, if I go, some rogue Russian general will launch a missile and, and you know, it, it'll just be a huge disaster. 30 years later, I'm in Georgetown, Texas, uh, uh, listening to a Christian missionary speak who was a who was a soldier in the Soviet army. And he, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, he got out of the army and became a, a, um, a Christian uh, um, uh, missionary person. And, and he was in Georgetown speaking and he was saying, uh, he was talking about the fall of the Berlin Wall. And, and he said, you know, had President Bush gone to Berlin and stood on the wall and and uh, said, hey, look at us, we won the Cold War, we would have launched missiles. Mm. And, and, um, and then he said, I'm so proud of President Bush that he didn't go. And, and because of that, I've carried a picture of him in my wallet all these years. And he pulls out the picture and it was a picture I had taken. Oh my gosh. So I raised my hand and I said, you're not gonna believe this, but what you just said, I was in the Oval Office and the president of the United States was saying the exact same thing 30 years ago. And, and it was like, wow, you, you know, how incredible was that? Uh, and, and, you know, that was kind of the instinct of, of President Bush that, that uh, you, you know, when, when he started in his career, he was one of the youngest Navy fighter pilots in World War II. And then he was an oil man and a congressman and, and, a, and, uh, uh, the head of the Central Intelligence Agency and our liaison uh, to the People's Republic of China and our ambassador to the United Nations and vice president and then president. And in all those years, you know, he met so many people from around the world. So when Iraq invaded Kuwait and he had to pull together a world coalition, it was easy for him to pick up the phone uh, and, and talk to Margaret Thatcher or, 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 or President Mitterrand of France or you know any of those world leaders, Chancellor Kohl of Germany, uh, because they were people that he had known all his life. And, and he used to pick up the phone just kind of randomly and, and say, hey, hey, Maggie, how you doing? You know, how are the kids? What's going on? And and then when it came time to pull together the World Coalition, you know, he was able to do that uh, uh, easily. And, and um, you know, I was a part of documenting all of that. And I'll never forget, uh, uh, I, I used to get um, uh, three schedules for the president. One was a monthly block schedule, which would, which would show the whole month of activities for the president. But it might be, you know, a, a trip to Ohio and California and, and, and then you'd get a, a a weekly schedule, which was a little tighter, you know, show cabinet meetings and meeting with congressional leaders. And then every day you'd get a daily blocks, uh, a daily uh, minute by minute schedule. And it was in a little booklet and, and I would photograph every line in, in there. And uh, a couple of days before the beginning of the first Gulf War, uh, the schedule just had private time. And he was really, you know, planning the war and, and one day uh, I got called into the Oval Office and, and uh, um, uh, you know, I, I asked Patty Presock who ran the front Oval Office, said, you know, what, what's going on? And she said, well, just go in. And I go in and it's Colin Powell who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs and, and uh, Dick Cheney who was the Secretary of Defense at the time. And, and I realized that the, uh, uh, the World Coalition was going to start removing Iraq from Kuwait. 
and I started taking photos and, and I was, you know, I would usually spend, you know, five, 10 minutes in the Oval Office and then I'd leave. But that day when I went to leave, the door was locked and I was locked in. I was in the Oval Office for 12 hours because it was so highly classified. Once I got exposed to that, uh, I couldn't leave. So just off the Oval Office, there's um, uh, a little dining room for the president and a little private study. And so I would go in there and, and uh, I'd wait for a little while. And then every time you would pick up the phone and he would call you know, the world leaders or our congressional leaders, well, you know, that was something new that was going on. So you'd go back in and photograph that and, and uh, you know, uh, maybe James Baker, the Secretary of State, would come over, and so then that was something else you would uh, photograph. And then uh, Brent Scowcroft, the National Security Advisor, would come in, and you go and photograph that. But but you know that period of time, uh, you, you know, was just just absolutely incredible. Um, when uh, George Bush was Vice President, we went to Communist Poland. And met with shipyard worker Lech Walesa, and, and Lech Walesa uh, said to George Bush, Vice President George Bush, "Someday Poland will be free, and someday you, George Bush, will be president of the United States." Mm -hmm. But when when the communism fell, Poland was freed, and Lech Walesa was elected president of a free Poland. And President Bush went to visit with him in downtown Gdansk, Poland. And I was up on the stage with the two presidents uh, with over a million people out in, in the plaza there, uh, cheering them on, uh, uh, celebrating freedom uh, from communism. And it was, you know, quite, quite the experience to be a part of that and to see, you know, the, the fall of the Soviet Union and, 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 and freedom uh, in all of those Baltic states uh, is pretty incredible. Did you ever get imposter syndrome? Um, now, what does that mean? Just where you're like, I can't believe that, you know, I'm doing this. Like, how did I get here? <laughs> I, you know. Um, like, uh, it's doubts. It's really doubts about yourself. Imposter <laughs> syndrome is where you're doubting like, yourself and you're like, how am I in this? You know. Well, you, you know a guy born in Alice, Texas, working at the White House. How does that happen? And, and um, one day, just before the beginning of the first Gulf War, I was alone in the Oval Office with two other White House staff people. And we kind of looked around at each other and, and, and said, you know, we need to say a prayer. And, and we the three of us stood there in the Oval Office, in the center of the Oval Office, prayed for the president, prayed for the military, prayed for the people of Kuwait. And, and, and when I, um, you know, look back and think about it, it's like, you know, you know maybe, maybe I was put in this position um, uh, for that reason. And, and, uh, I'll never forget, we were in the Kremlin one time with, with Soviet President uh, Gorbachev, and we were signing some nuclear arms agreements, and, and we're walking out of the Kremlin, and there's, you know, when you're with two presidents like that, you know, there's a whole gaggle of people, and the, the two presidents were kind of leading the way, and, and Gorbachev stops, and he says, oh, wait a minute, we need to go down this, look down this hallway here and we stop and turn around and go back and we get to this room and there are these big giant gold doors and and Gorbachev pushes these doors open and we walk in and so we're in the Kremlin in an atheist country and um, we walk into the Tsar's chapel so the 70 years of communism and they never remove the Tsar's chapel from the Kremlin, they kept it pristine. And, and then another time, back when he was vice president, uh, there was a period in the late 80s when just about every year, one of the Soviet leaders would uh, pass away and we'd go to Russia and go to the funeral. And then one of the funerals, and I can't remember which one it was right now, but um, 
uh, the, the funerals, processionals are like military parades because they're atheist and and so it's an open casket and here comes the casket and all the soldiers marching down Red Square and, and they get and they bury the, uh, the leader there in the in the Kremlin wall and uh, that particular leader may have been Brezhnev or Cherninko and, and uh, uh, moments before they closed the casket uh, his wife made the sign of the cross and we're standing there with with Margaret Thatcher and Fidel Castro and Yasser Arafat and we oh. were all seeing this and yeah, I was there taking a picture of it and, and it was like wow did you just see that you know that there there was um, here we are in an atheist country and the wife of the leader is showing that she has some faith now this happened before I started working there but when George Bush was our liaison to the People's Republic of China he went he met with Chairman Mao and they were talking through interpreters and Chairman Mao um, uh, is kind of you know being philosophical and then he says um, when I die and go to heaven and and so the interpreter tells that to the president and then Mao realizes that he said when I die and go to heaven and then he rephrases it and he says when I die um, but here is you know the head of a communist party billions of people and and in his heart he's thinking about heaven yeah. and 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 so how does david valdez get to from alice texas get to the white house you know i don't know i don't know <laughs> well what what's been one of the wins that you were most happy about one of your, or one of your favorite photographs well, you, you know, the, the one of them in bed or, 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 or this one here over my shoulder, but, but um, uh, one that I, it, it's more of a story than, than, a, than a photograph was the very first time I went to Kenny Bunkport, um, uh, the, the, their house uh, in Kenny Bunkport, Maine, there's Walker's Point and Walker's Point. It's a little peninsula where the bushes have uh, their house and and uh, they've over the years they've built a couple more houses out there and and but when I was there the first time uh, the president uh, was walking me around the, the property and he was telling me that uh, we get down to the dock where he docked his boat and, and he said you know as a little boy I used to go um, swimming here he said you and I ought to do that and you know I'm I'm from South Texas, and that's the Atlantic Ocean. It's like there's no way I'm going to jump in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I have my cameras, and 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 he said, ah, oh, it'll be fine. He said, look, I got a couple of swimsuits up at the house. Let's walk back up to the house, and um, uh, and we'll get some swimsuits. And so we walk up to the house. We go into the bedroom. We strip down. We both put on the swimsuits. We walk back down. And he says, on the count of three, we'll jump. So one, two, three, I jumped, and he walked back to the house. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, okay, you got me. And, uh, uh, but you know, we, we had a, a good fun relationship like that. And, 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 uh, and, and it was great, you, you know, uh, when I think back of uh, all the things that he did for me and my family over the years and, and, uh, you know, taking care of everybody. I, the very first time my wife has food allergies and then the very first time we had lunch with them, uh, they were serving this like this egg salad thing, and and my wife's allergic to eggs, and my wife is sitting on my right, and Barbara Bush is on my left, and and um, my wife and I were like, oh, what are we gonna do? You know, you can't eat that, and, and and of course Mrs. Bush knows everything, and 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 she kind of pushes me back in the chair, and she and she says, to my wife Sarah Jane, she says, you know, Sarah Jane, I kind of feel like a um, hamburger. How about you? <laughs> it would be great and, and uh, it, it, you know it was, it was just those little things like that that you know just kind of kept you going what was the biggest challenge for you throughout your career 
Um, well, it, you know, it, it was real, it, it, it could have been real easy to get a big head. And, and I, I think my wife kind of kept me grounded and, and uh, that was a real good thing. I know uh, some folks have, you know, got really big heads about themselves and, you know, think they're all hoity toity and it's like, you know, uh, I was just a guy from Texas and, and uh, I was, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity and, and, uh, you know, I sometimes look back and say, wow, you know, uh, I can't believe that that happened, but it did. And, and I'm a part of history and, and, uh, you know, what an honor, uh, to have that. And, and, uh, uh, you know, I don't go around saying, oh, you know, look at me or, you know, I got to tell you something, you, you know, I'm out with my friends and, and, you know, unless, unless a friend of mine will, will say something and, uh, I have a good friend, Sean Jones, and he's always, always, always introducing me and saying, this is David Valdez. He was President Bush's photographer. It's like, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a Corvette guy here and, you know, trying to be cool. <laughs> I love it. And your wife for supporting you because you were working a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, she used to keep track of me on, on the news. And she would know where I was in the world. And and uh, 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 back in those days, um, when they first started coming out with cell phones, they had these big, they called them bricks, <laughs> cell phones with an antenna on it. And I was one of the first people to get those uh, because she always wanted me to call her. But, you know, you'd get back from some trip at two o'clock in the morning and you'd land at Andrews Air Force Base then fly to the White House. And then you have to get in your car and drive home. And, and she would say, well, you know, give me a call. And so I'd have to stop along the freeway somewhere and find a gas station and use a pay phone to call and say, I'm on my way. But if I could, I could be there sooner if I could get off the phone and just drive home. <laughs> and and uh, so she got me one of those cell phones, those big bricks and, and uh, you know, We've been connected ever since. So what if someone was wanting to chase a dream, they haven't yet started, or maybe they are, what's advice you would give and tips that you learned along the way? Well, you, you know, one of the most important things you can do in life, and this is life in general, is, 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 is be kind and, and, and care for others. Um, because as you're going up, you're going to come back down. And somewhere along the line, you're going to pass those people again. And um, I know for a fact that that happened to me. And and um, I, it, you know, it's it's easy to be, you know, holier than thou. And but you know, I'm always you know tell people you know, be be kind. And, and, and be gracious to everybody you meet uh, uh, because you're gonna, you're gonna come back and forth and, and it's, it's, it's only gonna do you good. It's not gonna do you any good to cut bridges because that'll come back and haunt you at some point. And, and uh, I know, I know, you know being, being good to other people has helped me financially and made me financially secure uh, uh, because of different situations that have happened in my life. And, and um, uh, I always tell young people, you know, uh, just be good to people. I love it. And then where, where can we find you and where can we get your book? You said we could get it on Amazon. Yeah, yeah, George Herbert Walker Bush, a photographic profile. Uh, on Amazon, I'm on I'm David Valdez USA on Instagram, and um, uh, you know I'm on the um, I do the Corvette Invasion Instagram, and I and I'm on the uh, uh, GTX Film uh, Festival Instagram, and I uh, I'm on the Williamson Museum. Um, board and I'm on the Georgetown Arts and Culture Board 
and we're gearing up to do an art festival in October and in the film festival will be um, uh, at the end of September, 1st of October in Georgetown. And I'm involved with all of those. And then my photo display uh, at the Williamson Museum um, uh, next March. And then I also host the Georgetown, Texas Photography Festival in my spare time. And um, uh, I'm gearing up to go down to Bastrop, Texas for the Corvette invasion here in about two weeks. And, and uh, you know, have a whole, whole uh, a world of, of Corvetting and I do the Instagram for the Corvette invasion. So other than that, you know, uh, I go to the swimming pool and take my dog for a walk. My dog has an Instagram. Uh, <laughs> what also, kind of dog do you have? Uh, it's, he's a Sheltie and uh, he's followed by Texas A&M University. And, and uh, um, uh, so, he, you know, he's a big part of the picture these days so that's a lot of fun too is there anything that i missed um no uh, um, just be sure and come out to the uh uh corvette invasion in bastrop uh in, in july and and happy fourth of july and and thank you for uh inviting me on i really appreciate it Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. And I feel like I need to have you again, because now I feel like I need to even dig deeper and ask you even more questions. It's just an incredible journey that yeah. you've had. Yeah, you, you know, I got a million stories. Uh, <laughs> um, well, thank you again. It was such a pleasure and such an honor to get to meet you. Yeah, so, okay. Thank you very much. That was so incredible. Can you imagine to have all those experiences? Tell me what you thought. Send me a message. You can send it to bonnie at bonnielang.com or reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. If you're chasing your dream, I'd love to hear from you too. And if you're enjoying these podcasts as much as I am, share them with a friend. Sending you peace, love, happiness, and hugs. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you're on Apple Podcast, make sure you give me a five-star rating and a review. It helps others get to see this as well. Have a great day.